I wasn't actually sure that I was going to make it here in time for my talk, so I'm sort of almost shocked to be, you know, out of my car and standing in front of you right now. So, um, and I don't know actually what title, what the. Okay, I'm not sure what title you have in your program. Um, we've been looking at different types of interneurons, but I think what encompasses. Um, many different aspects of our research program right now is input and target specific plasticity. Um, what I'm showing you here is some microscopy that we've been doing to do, uh, quantitatively um, examine changes in slime cortical synapses. And um, these are, uh, we've been using some of Don Arnold's um, finger proteins to label PSD95 and align them to particular inputs to see how those inputs are being modified um, as animals are learning. But I thought I would start off just by telling you what frames my research interests, and that is really how experience drives learning. How do we connect things that happen in the external world to things that change in the brain and then change our behavior? And, you know, there's sort of multiple steps here, um, very few of which we have any clear idea. And I, I suspect that some of the speakers who preceded me, who I didn't get to hear, were talking about some of these, these, same, um, these same issues. Of course, there's sort of many different steps. You know, it's not one or two, or there's probably five or more. But one of the assumptions that I have in my research is that um, if we look at synapses, they serve as some sort of fingerprint of important um, nodes in the circuit that are modified during learning. It doesn't have to be that synapses undergo persistent modification. And of course, you know, maybe a tiny minority of synapses that undergo persistent modifications. But when we see particular classes of input and target-specific synapses undergoing changes, that gives us some idea about what kinds of um, pathways and computations might be really critical during learning. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide here. Oh, I have a pointer. Great. Um, the focus of the work in my lab is on the sensory cortex. Now, I think probably temperamentally people can be divided into, you know, those who are really interested in motor outputs and those who are interested in sensation. And one of the things that's appealing to me about sensation is it's only a few steps from the periphery. I know what's coming in, sort of, I kind of know what's coming in anyway. And then, you know, within a few hundred milliseconds, right, it's now, you know, everything's sort of impossibly tangled together. But at least in the beginning, we have some idea of what's driving neurons. And actually, that's not even true. But we think we have some idea of what's driving neurons in sensory cortex, and we know where that input is coming from. If we think about what composes the architecture of the cerebral cortex, one thing that's become abundantly clear over the past decade or so is that there's a multitude of different cell types. Uh, I've sort of schematized some of them here. Probably about 50, 30 to 50 different cell types. The vast diversity of those is in GABAergic cell types. We are in a period right now where we're trying to figure out, have we over split those groups? Are there really only eight different types of inhibitory neurons? Or are there, for example, in the, class, in, in the case of sonatostatin cells, are there as many as um, 21 different classes? So we, we don't quite know where we are that, uh, with that. It may be, though, some of these functional differences actually will tell us whether these are bona fide classes. These neurons are arrayed across six layers of the cortex. It is a highly conserved structure that we see in dogs and humans and mice and manatees and elephants, right? So it's very conserved architecture. It's also sort of very, um, sort of had multi-potential. So uh, we had the same six-layered structure that exists in auditory cortex and some sensory cortex, and even in uh, motor cortex, which has a rudimentary layer four. So it seems like this is kind of the wheel of the brain. You can take this, comp this computational unit, use it to do all sorts of different things, um, and, and yet we don't really have a good idea of what that computation might be. Now, these neurons are connected in highly stereotyped ways. I've schematized this here. This is actually extracted from, you know, dozens and dozens of studies over several decades to, you know, give me some idea of what uh, connections are possible. Um, and I'll just point out a couple things here to show you that there are some rules here. So it's not like we're swimming in a sea of, you know, like anything could happen. So one of my favorite types of neurons here is this metastatin neuron here in yellow. And you can see the somatostatin neurons were inhibitory neurons, and they, they are connected to a lot of other cell types across the cortical column. But the one thing is they are never connected to each other. So, right, we can look at this matrix. This is not telling you the number, the abundance of these synapses. It's just telling you the probability of connections. But it says there are some pathways which can be are po possible and some pathways which are not. Now, these different types of neurons have very specific 
stereotyped responses. When you can subdivide these neurons, you'll see things like this. This is a somatostatin cell in superficial layers of the cortex. And you see when there's a sensory stimulus, in this case, it's a whisker stimulus, you can see it hyperpolarizes here. These are fast spiking, presumably PD expressing um, GABAergic neurons. You can see that they're responding rapidly with a lot of spikes to some sensory stimulus. And I'll just point out down here the excitatory neurons, which are by far the most abundant in the cortical column. About 80% of the cells in layer 2, 3 are excitatory neurons. But you can see there's almost no spikes that are generated. And that actually is a very, it's a persistent mystery. What is it that best drives even neurons in sensory cortex? We're sort of, you know, almost back in the 60s when people and weasel were delighted to see that orientation could act adequately, you know, uh, cause visual neurons to spike. But it's still only a minority of neurons in visual cortex that are driven by oriented lines. Okay. So what I want to understand is with this architecture, what is changing when animals are learning something? And that's a big matrix, right? I didn't even draw all the cell types we have, but we have about a matrix of 30 by 30. That's 900 potential connections. And then I want to see which ones are being altered. I was telling about this, my, you know, my big plan about eight years ago to one of my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon. And, and she's like, well, that's going to take you decades to solve. And I'm like, yes, it will. And, you know, I mean, we actually are making, I, I'm actually quite pleased with the progress that we're making. Um, using a bunch of different techniques, both electrophysiological and anatomical techniques. But one of the critical things that we needed in order to be able to do this was a really a high throughput way to train animals. I was quite um, uh, um, affected by a visit that I took to the Allen Brain Institute where they had, you know, this wall of cages and, and an army of, of people who are training animals literally in three shifts a day. And I realized that my little lab was never going to be able to do something like that. So the, one of the things that was going to be really important was a high, through, a high throughput behavioral training, where we have hands off training of these animals so that we can then do these very detailed analyses of different synaptic connections. So the goal here is to monitor, identify and monitor cell type specific changes in synapse um, properties um, to figure out if there's some sequence to these changes across the cortical column. And we need that cell type resolution, both of inputs and targets. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about the behavioral training apparatus that we designed. So this is a home cage apparatus. And oh, I see my words are coming up there. OK. Uh, so this is a home cage apparatus. We literally just drop the animals into this cage. My, my students have become totally spoiled now because you know they do have to kind of clean out the cage and kind of reset the electronics every time they put it in. But that's all they have to do. And uh, we acclimate them to the cage for about a day or two so that they understand where the water is coming from. They have no problem figuring it out. It comes from this little lick port here. And then after that time, we now introduce a sensory stimulus where there's a, a very gentle air puff. So an aversive air puff might be in the order of 50 PSI. This is on the order of 5 PSI. We've kind of uh, looked at a bunch of different stimulus intensities. 5 is a pretty good intensity to get them to participate and also make that association within about a day. Okay. And that I can show you r roughly how strong that stimulus is. Oops. Right, so if you can see these whiskers moving, maybe you can't. But it's, it's a very gentle stimulus. The first couple times they get it, they're a little freaked out. But then um, they rapidly acclimate to it. OK, so what we're going to measure to see if the animals are learning is their lick frequency. We're going to measure their lick frequency um, right before that water would come. Now, during the acclimation period, there's no signal that water will be emitted. And so um, they have no idea when they should lick. And there are some trials that don't have water, right? So we kind of set that up because we're going to pair the stimulus with some water reward. And some of these trials aren't going to have any, um, any stimulus or water. When we start training the animals, we're going to deliver an air puff here. It's a 500 millisecond air puff. And what we're going to look at is the anticipatory licking right before when the water arrives. So there's a random delay here when the animal approaches the lick port, does that initial beam break. Then there's the air puff. Then 500 milliseconds after the cessation of that air puff, water is delivered. They'll, when they have made this association, they're going to start to lick. When they get the stimulus, they're going to start to lick before the air puff arrives. Now, we were particularly interested in this. I'll show this slide, but just for sort of conversational purposes. We wanted to have a sensory stimulus that might reverberate within the circuit so that when that reward information arrived, that there may, might be some sort of credit assignment to those activated synapses. This was sort of the idea, right? So that if we had the stimulus plus the water, that some of this activity might still remain, that if it was just the water, that would not necessarily um, strengthen or consolidate any of those sensory inputs. 
Let me just give you a quick look at how these animals are behaving. So here's an animal. This is actually, um, nothing happens. So you can see he goes into the air po into the um, uh, the the port here, and um, uh, he has a, it's, he has a two second timeout, but he will do as many trials as he wants to do uh, within this uh, 24 hour window. Normally, animals will seek to get about 2.5 mils a day of water. They're not water restricted at all. We just drop them in, um, and uh, that's usually a couple hundred trials. Okay, so. In the acclimation period, they're licking to the stimulus in green, or those, or actually there's no stimulus, to the water trials in green, or the blank trials is identical because they don't know which is going to be which. After just a day of training, what we see is that they're licking when they get that whisker stimulus is higher than in those blank trials. So they, their behavior starts to change, and that's how we know that they're making some association. We can look at those, so those, the, the um, red here is the licking in those blank trials. The green is licking in those stimulus trials. You can see that when the air, when the animal, when the air puff is turned on, the animals will have a brief period where they don't, right? They, they uh, avoid licking and then they will recover and you'll start to see an increase in that lick frequency. Um, the, the, uh, there's a diurnal rhythm here to the number of trials, which is shown in gray. We subtract these two curves, we see something like this. And if we look at the last 20% of trials on any given day, we can see that over a large population, something like 25 animals there, um, there's a significant difference in licking. If we look at their performance over time, we see that, um, you know, after a day or two, they've really mastered this task. And we can also see, and I think this is a really important part of this task, we can see that different animals master the task at different, um, at, 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 with different amounts of training. So this animal learned at the first day, right, you can see this green, the licking to the stimulus is much higher than licking to the blank. Interesting that what we see is that licking to the blank actually gets suppressed, and licking to the stimulus kind of stays pretty even. So part of the way they're differentiating here is they're suppressing their licking when they don't get that stimulus. I, I'm totally fascinated by that. This guy down here took a super long time to learn. He did, right? He's still differentiating it, but um, he was much slower. All right, so I mentioned that one of the things that's appealing about sensory cortex is we know where information is coming in. And we initially, we decided we were going to look at thalamic um, afferents to the to, to, uh, primary synoptic sensory cortex, the barrel cortex. So there's two main pathways by which sensory information reaches the cortex. We have the pink pathway and the green pathway. We have the first order thalamic inputs from VPM that synapse primarily in layer four, but a little bit in layer 5B. And then we have higher order thalamus that does have some fast sensory responses. That synapse is in layer 5A and layer one. So these layer two neurons and these layer five neurons are the ones that get the um, most of that input. So what we're gonna do is train these animals and make acute brain slices and then ask, are any of these specific synapses altered? In this case, we're just gonna do whole cell patch clamp recording with channel rhodopsin in our pathway of choice, either this VPM fast first order thalamus or the POM, the second order um, slower thalamus. And what we're gonna um, look at is can we elicit some spikes? So optogenetic stimulation in control animals here in black shows you some cells have a few spikes, some cells don't, and we can uh, give you a, a sort of peristimulus time histogram here. You can see that there's some response for these layer four neurons. And then after one day of training, what we see is that um, there uh, are still some responses here, but there's no significant difference in the number of spikes that we can elicit with this optogenetic stimulation in this particular pathway. We also looked at layer five and layer two, which both directly and indirectly receive excitation from this first order thalamic nucleus, and we also didn't see um, strong changes in the evoked response there. The higher order thalamic pathway, the POM pathway, and that's actually kind of an interesting story how we even decided to look at that, because for many years that was not on people's radar, we actually started to look at it because we had been studying some FOS expressing neurons in sensory cortex, and they were strongly driven by it. And so we had a bunch of experiments. We were really trying to tease out what that relationship was. But when we, yeah. In other learning assays, it does seem to be very important. Um, that work was done, uh, Lucy Palmer has done some of that work, and Su Hin Lee has done some of that work. We came at it because we knew that it was an important activator of FOSS-expressing neurons. 
Okay, so channel rhodopsin and POM, whole cell patch clamp in acute brain slices. This is in control animals, strong input to layer five, driving some spiking. Uh, you can see, just look at the scale here, this is 50 hertz. And in layer two, three, not a lot of spikes, but some subthreshold activity. After just one day of training, what we see is a really marked increase in the strength of that POM um, input in driving activity here in layer two and also in layer five. So this pathway in particular is being altered um, during this sensory association training. To look at these synapses, we use some tricks that electrophysi electrophysiologists do to isolate individual release events. And so uh, we used um, strontium in our bath solution instead of calcium. That strontium desynchronizes neurotransmitter release so that we can isolate individual um, uh, uh, responses to uh, vesicles, presynaptic vesicles that are released. And when we look at then the strength of this POM synapse on these two target um, uh, uh, populations, it, pyramidal cells in layer two and layer five, what we see is that in layer two, um, uh, <clears throat> let's start with layer five actually, there was a huge difference in layer five and an early difference in layer five. Um, we see that these synapses are potentiated and that potentiation is retained at least for a couple days. In layer two, we see that initially there's no um, synaptic strengthening, although there is a change in firing, we think that's inherited from layer five, and that by two days of this training, um, we see a significant increase in the strength of these synapses. So, one of the things that we've done with this preparation is we've kind of tricked the animals in going to the lick port so we can stimulate their whiskers. Although I do want to point out, this is such an interesting sort of, you know, mystery. These are freely moving animals. We have 24 hours of time that they're in this cage or 48 hours of time, right? They carry out a couple hundred trials and a trial takes a couple seconds, right? So we've got maybe 400 seconds that they're undergoing this sort of stimulus. And the rest of those 24 hours, right? I mean, that's like 23.75 hours or whatever, 23.9 hours. They're not having this particular stimulus coupled with the reward. So is it something about this particular stimulus that is driving this plasticity? And in order to understand that, we devised a second training regimen. We call it pseudo-training. Now, in this case, the stimulus is coupled with the reward sometimes, but sometimes it's uncoupled. So we actually keep the frequency of the stimulus the same. 80% of the trials will have a stimulus, but the stimulus is not always followed by a reward, and sometimes there's a reward without a stimulus. So you can actually see, normally they get water on 80% of their trials. In pseudo-training, they get water on 50% of their trials. They actually increase their trial number a little bit because they're thirsty and they're really aiming for, to get that two and a half um, mils of water a day. But what we see under those conditions is this POM potentiation that's visible um, at just after one day of training is absent after pseudo-training. So that suggests it's really the pairing of the stimulus and the associate, uh, the, the stimulus and the reward that's driving this kind of plasticity. And this is something that we're really interested in pursuing. What makes it different to have the stimulus and reward be coupled here? Okay. This is one set of synapses that we've been looking at. These are some excitatory synapses. I, I want to give a shout out to one of my students, Joe Christian, who's been looking at, you know, there's a multitude of excitatory connections across the cortical column. And he's been particularly looking at this feed forward pathway from layer four um, to, uh, to superficial layers. And it's really remarkable how little is changing. So these P1 synapses are very plastic and they're strongly, um, uh, um, they're modified rapidly at the onset of training. But a lot of other excitatory synapses are barely changed, if at all. Um, and it seems to be also very short lived. Um, we have been interested in whether, so, you know, this is a great platform to have hypotheses, I mean, about what is required for some of these synaptic changes to happen. Initially, I thought, oh, layer five's, you know, uh, potentiating earlier than layer two. Maybe layer five is helping layer two, is helping to drive plasticity in layer two. And, um, you know, there are sort of a bunch of different experiments that we did, you know, look at various temporal um, uh, contingencies. And, you know, I, I have to say, I think we basically made a business of being wrong here. Um, we also decided to look at inhibitory neurons, and I'm going to tell you about some of those data now. Um, again, I mean, you know, we, ha we thought maybe you can change inhibition, and that will also help potentiate these very simple hypotheses, uh, I think. It's 
not quite so simple, but um, you know, we can. It was a good uh, a good rationale to start doing some of these experiments. So we thought perhaps we can. One of the initial things that happens during learning is that you reduce inhibition. And we thought about the main sources of inhibition to pyramidal cells. That's really two different classes of GABAergic inhibition, somatostatin inhibition and parvalbumin inhibition. Now, of course, it's not quite that simple because these PD neurons and somatostatin cells, they are also inhibited, and there are very specific pathways by which they are inhibited. So these NDNF neurons, which lie in layer one, inhibit PD cells. These VIP neurons inhibit somatostatin cells. There's some crosstalk between PD and somatostatin as well, and, and, you know, there's actually 30 different types of interneurons. I've drawn, you know, a few of them here. So, in fact, it's actually much more complicated than that, right? We have different subsets of VIP neurons. There's cholinergic ones, non-cholinergic ones. There's different subsets of somatostatin cells. This matrix here is probably underpopulated, right? But we thought the, the, there's very strong connectivity between PD and somatostatin cells. Let's focus on those synapses first because they're poised to play such an important role in um, plasticity. And the idea was that if you could reduce inhibition, you might be able to enhance spiking transiently of pyramidal cells, and that would then um, facilitate this POM uh, plasticity, right? So there is some evidence dynamically that somatostatin cells can change their activity during learning. And we wanted to know whether they left a fingerprint in the strength of um, synapses. So we're going to assess this again using channel rhodopsin in our target input, and that is somatostatin cells. And we're going to put the animals in this training cage and look to see whether there was some alteration in this input. Now, we thought it would happen in layer five first because that's where this um, synaptic, these excitatory synaptic changes were happening. Um, we're, what I'm showing you here um, first is layer two, and what we did see was that there was a reduction in inhibition from somatostatin cells at the very earliest stages of training. But when we looked in layer five, we didn't see any change. So again, you know, we're wrong. It's not, not disinhibition particularly directly in layer five that's making that more sensitive to this, er, this early POM potentiation. Um, we did some controls to make sure that it didn't have something to do with altered excitability in somatostatin cells. If anything, they're slightly more excitable. So the, the reason that that somatostatin IPSC is smaller is not because we weren't driving it with our channel rhodopsin stimulus. It also looks like it's input specific. So if we record from a PD cell and drive somatostatin inhibition optogenetically, we didn't see any difference in the amplitude of that response. So it's particularly being reduced in pyramidal cells, not in, um, uh, in PD neurons. Now we have this nice other assay, and that is pseudo-training, right? So we now are going to decouple the stimulus and the reward, and we can look to see whether somatostatin inhibition is responding to that condition. And so again, remember, we have pseudo-training where we have the same number of stimuli, but they're decoupled from this um, reward. And what we see under those conditions is that somatostatin inhibition is not altered. So this has become a really useful way for us to tease apart what might be stimulus-dependent and what might be um, contingency dependent. And what this indicates to, to us is that somatostatin cells can detect when there is that con, um, convergence of stimulus followed by reward information. Now, this potentiation is short-lived. After a few days, it seems to um, be mitigated. It's no longer significantly different. And um, we don't see it, it sort of more slowly developing in layer five. It's still absent in layer five. Yeah. Of training. of training. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. So I want to just give us give you a little insight into what kinds of mechanisms could be involved here. We thought, you know, these, there, there are people who've recorded from somatostatin cells and they can see that their activity is being modulated by sensory input um, and maybe modified um, by, by um, training in some way. And we thought perhaps um, there is some reduction in somatostatin activity, and that's causing these terminals to uh, either retract or um, to uh, reduce their, their efficacy. And so we thought um, perhaps we could phenocopy this using chemogenetics to suppress the activity of somatostatin cells outside of any training context here. So we're not pairing the stimulus and reward here. We're just, we have the same kind of setup here. 
But now instead of water, we're giving them water actually that has the ligand for um, uh, these chemogenetic inhibitory um, receptors, um, CNO. So the animals live in this cage. Their somatostatin cells have been virally transduced with HM40I. So this is the dread that can hyperpolarize somatostatin cells. And when they're living in this cage, the water that they get has a small amount of CNO. So it slowly is building up in their system. You put them in that cage for a couple days, and then we record from the somatostatin iPSCs. Now we know that this CNO, it's um, sufficient in order to suppress the activity of somatostatin cells because in vivo, when we um, transduce with HM40I and give the animals um, uh, uh, CNO, um, so we're recording, we're looking at calcium transients in somatostatin cells before and after CNO administration, what we see is that the somatostatin cell, their activity is suppressed. And in this case, this is an acute delivery of CNO so that activity goes down, and then we'll slowly recover. So what happens after a couple days of, of chemogenetic suppression of somatostatin cell activity? We see now a reduction in the somatostatin iPSC when we record from pyramidal cells in layer two. Now, it's not on here, but interestingly enough, it also goes down in layer five. And that, to me, tells it suggests that this regulation of activity may be specific to superficial layers of the cortex and may not be, um, uh, may not be across all synopsis cells in, that, um, in, the, in the cortical column. If we then train these animals, can we drive a further reduction in somatostatin inhibition? And the answer is no. So in this case, these animals are housed in this environment. They're getting CNO, and their somatostatin iPSC is now much lower than the M-cherry um, injected controls that are also exposed to CNO. And then when we train them for another day, there is no longer a significant suppression of that somatostatin iPSC. So it looks like the reduction in somatostatin activity can phenocopy that reduction in somatostatin iPSCs that we can drive by training our animals. Yes, and let me show you some of that data. So this over here on the left is our m cherry control animals. So these animals have somatostatin cells that express m cherry, and they're also um, administered CNO in their drinking water. Um, you can see, it, we actually think there's a little, there's some suppression of learning under these conditions. Um, we think that CNO has some off-target effects, and we're um, replicating these results now using a different ligand for CNO. But in the animals where we have chemogenetically suppressed um, somatostatin cell activity, we actually see um, uh, quite um, reasonable um, learning. It looks much more like the control case. And in fact, it may even be slightly, um, uh, their, their ability to differentiate between the stimulus and the blank trials may actually be um, uh, better. <clears throat> so you can see in this case, right, this, is, this little diff here is when the air puff is turned on. We know that they can feel it because we can see them suppress their licking for, um, for a small number of trials. But then by the end of that first day, their performance, they're licking much more to the stimulus than the blank compared to the m cherry injected controls. So it looks like something about somatostatin inhibition may be facilitating your acquisition of this um, association. OK. So what I've just shown you is that somatostatin depression is specific to the learning condition. Um, when we pair that stimulus plus that water reward, we see a suppression of somatostatin um, inhibition selectively in superficial layers of the cortex. We can phenocopy that by suppressing the activity of somatostatin cells. And pseudotraining, where the animals are receiving that whisker stimulus, is not sufficient to drive this reduction in activity. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to fill in some of these black boxes, but we think at some point there is some circuit mechanism that suppresses somatostatin activity and that is related to that stimulus and reward contingency. OK, so I showed you this matrix in the beginning, right? There's a lot of different nodes of this matrix and a lot of different, particularly inhibitory synapses. And we're now deeply um, invested in trying to figure out which inhibitory neurons are most sensitive to this. Clearly, somatostatin cells are a really important node in this. 
And in data that I'm not showing you, uh, we are looking at excitatory synapses on the somatostatin cells and different subtypes of somatostatin cells. And it looks like there are, there's a lot going on with this particular cell type. But there may also be a lot of plasticity going on with other inhibitory cell types. And that's quite interesting to me because the excitatory connections that we've been looking at just are bare, barely budging. So there's a lot of activity, a lot of changes happening at the synapse level with inhibitory synapses that we're not necessarily seeing at the excitatory synapses level. Now, it looks like it's short-lived. It looks like it's happening at the onset of the stimulus um, uh, plus reward training. And that is also something really interesting um, that we are continuing to pursue. Um, so what I've shown you here is that of this large number of synapses, we've identified a few here in, in pink that seem to be particularly modified. So these are the fingerprints. These are the fingerprints of the crime scene. What is changing here? We have a couple synapses, the POM pathway, and somatostatin synapses seem to be particularly important. We have looked at the PD synapses. There's a sex-specific difference there, which is, you know, complicated because we don't see that um, any behavioral difference in training between males and females. So we don't think that PV plasticity may be critical to learning, you know, broadly writ. But um, there are probably other um, important nodes in this network that are being altered. And I think in the interest of time, I, I won't go through this um, uh, in, in detail, um, but I hope that you're convinced that we can use this automated sensory association training and modifications of it, where we manipulate stimulus and reward contingencies to come up with really, um, uh, I, I think, uh, important insights into how the cortical column may be detecting the convergence of stimulus and reward information um, and what that might be um, enabling um, downstream. And with that, I want to thank the people who've done this work. Um, particularly Yinsel Park, who is just a superstar, and she has been working on the somatostatin project um, for about four and a half years now, and, um, you know, every experiment is more interesting than the last, and she's just curious about everything, and um, she's the kind of person who comes up, you know, after a couple of weeks and like, I was just wondering this, so I tried this experiment, and you're like, oh my god, it's amazing. And then um, Joe Christian, who's been looking at a bunch of excitatory synapses, and, you know, we've narrowed in on a couple things that might be changing, but it really is highlighting the importance of altered inhibition in this network. Like, um, Mozu, who has done some in vivo imaging, and then some of the really beautiful anatomy that you've seen here um, was done by Ajit Ray and uh, Matt Masso. And so I'm going to stop there, and thank you all. First question. So, um, is there a correlation between the effects of plasticity that you're seeing and um, the variability in how long it takes the animal to learn the behavior that you started with? So, you know, we are, are that, that's one of the great things about training. I mean, we've trained hundreds of animals at this point. We don't make all, the, all measurements from all animals, but, and of course, it's not, you can never look at the same animal twice, right? So um, <clears throat> there are some interesting correlations that we see. On the first day of training, we don't see a correlation between the somatostatin IPSC and the animal's performance. Interestingly, on the, as training proceeds, we do see a correlation, and it's, it's remarkably strong, actually, um, so that animals who have... Um, a lower um, somatostatin IPSC seem to um, perform better. So I, I think that, you know, the correlations are so tempting to be able to, to make, but, you know, there was a, um, I'm trying to remember the authors of this study, you know, there's nothing that said, obviously the brain is changing before your behavior changes, right? And so it, there's nothing that says that we're going to see synaptic changes that will follow behavioral change, right? The synaptic changes are likely to be prior to the behavioral changes, and those correlations, may, we may only be able to detect them, you know, as the animal is trained. But the other thing that really has come out of a lot of this work is that all of these changes in primary sensory cortex are very transient. So, and, and you know, I think by a number of different measures, they're very transient. I mean, we were looking for an engram, right, using FOSS expression, right, to try to target these FOSS expressing cells.
And we saw no evidence for an engram in primary sensory cortex. And so I think that primary sensory cortex is being used at the onset of, of training, but I think that it is not um, required once the animals made the association. Sorry for the long answer. I was wondering how much of the transience has to do with additional training, driving, further changes somewhere else, and these are no longer needed versus like consolidation. So if you stop training, does the memory persist? Do you see similar transitions from one site to another? Um, we haven't done that experiment where we stop training. Sometimes, you know, like the air runs out and, you know, like someone's just desperate and they'll just do the, you know, record anyway. I think it goes away is our, is our um, sense from, you know, not having done the experiment with, you know, a couple mice that didn't really, you know, weren't properly prepared. Um, so is, you asked uh, something else as well. Uh, that was the main question, how yeah. much of the transitions depended on the additional training. But I do have a second question, which is um, in your pseudo conditioning, yeah. do you think the um, un, uh, no CES get the juice anyhow trials are important, or is it just the 40% of unrewarded air puff trials? We are really interested in that. So we've been contingency or something yeah. Just, so so we have been talking and working. We have a graduate student in um, who's part of the a program in neural computation at CMU to sort of think about information theory and entropy and how that might be and might help us develop. You know, because there's actually a very clear relationship. And you know, one of the things that Yinsel has done is to alter those contingencies, right? So you know, 25% water, 25% water plus stimulus, 25% stimulus, 25% nothing, right? So we have all of these conditions now. I will say it doesn't look like there's mutual information, and that's also really interesting. Um, I so I, I want to because there was some speculation here. I, I just want to say I I I think that when the animal makes the association. I think that relieves some pressure in sensory cortex to maintain these changes. I think that they are actively maintained when the animal is uncertain about that causality. And I think when the animal gets it, I think that relieves the pressure on the system and these synapses rapidly renormalize. And, and again, I don't know if this is appropriate here, but I, I mean, we had years ago, like, now it's like 15 years ago, we've been looking at metaplasticity um, in a totally different preparation. But what we found is that synapses would rapidly potentiate, and then NMDA receptor activation actually sought to kind of renormalize them. And so it was actually hard to keep them, you know, high um, after that process had occurred. So I think that there's something really interesting there, but I think that there's some pressure that's maintaining them. And when the animals aren't, um, when they when they get it, it, that pressure goes away. More questions? All right. Over the course of training, did you, because there's, because we think of this as just merely an association between the puff and, and the licking, but there's other forms of learning going on. One is the timing yeah. of the lick and the delay, yeah. and that type of, that uh, learning takes longer. So it could be you're also, and I think Jennifer was getting to this a bit, that there's these different forms of learning that are, are going on. Do you see a change in the lick latency over the course of days? So, so people have described that there's this shift for more and more precise learning, but maybe your interval's not long enough for that. Yeah, so we can change the interval. Um, and we tried making it well, a full second. It was definitely harder for the animals to learn when it was one second. Um, and actually, I have, so I just hired a, a CMU grad who has been digging into this behavioral data, which we have, you know, like, like I said, it's hundreds of animals under various conditions. And so we're just starting to look at that now, where we look at the, the timing of the, the licks. But yeah, you have the data already, we right? We have the data so, so already. So you just haven't looked at it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, and I mean, unfortunately, actually, so we're, we're, we sample every, ten, every 100 milliseconds. Uh, I see. And so we, we have, you know, 100 millisecond bins where we can say if there's a lick or not. And, and I don't know what you think, but that might not be good enough. Yeah. yeah. 
but we can re redesign the apparatus. Thank you. Very, very beautiful talk. So uh, at the beginning of your talk, or earlier in your talk, you mentioned that what the animals learn is to actually not lick when there is no uh, uh, puff, right? So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what you think that asymmetry means, that it's not that they learn to lick when the puff is there, but that they rather learn to not lick when the puff is not there. Well, they do learn to lick when the puff is there, but, um, but they are, their performance gets better because they stop licking when the puff isn't there. Um, and I, I mean, you know, it's, I, I, I feel like I have been quite affected by these ideas of predictive coding. Um, and I'm really interested in how an animal detects something that isn't there, right? What's the signal that there wasn't a signal? And I think that there is an expectation of that stimulus. And when that expectation is not met by some sensory input, that then triggers a behavior, a behavioral response. But that, that computation is absolutely fascinating. This is a really beautiful system to see how the animals, I mean, and actually if we design the task in another way, which is you either get the air puff or you get the water, right, then they would have run away. We wouldn't have seen it. But, but we're in a position now to understand what is the animal detecting when there isn't the air puff. Thank you, that's very yeah. interesting. Um, you started your talk saying how wonderful it was to go out to the sensory systems because you had some idea of what the input was. And I was wondering <laughs> if you go even further out, what happens in POM? Do you have any idea? No. I mean, we, we have begun to image um, POM axons um, in layer one in sensory cortex. And, but we're not doing it in the task context. We do see that the calcium transients in the POM axons in the beginning of training actually go up. That doesn't necessarily mean that there are more spikes in those neurons. And actually, Randy Bruno has been trying to do this image POM neuron activity, and it's been very difficult. I think that work's still not published, and I, I think it's, it's been hard to, to see that. Generally, people don't think that there's a lot of plasticity in thalamic neurons, but I, I couldn't say. The, when we image the axons in layer one, we do see that they go up. That response goes up to a whisker stimulus. But I actually think that might be because there's less somatostatin inhibition. And we know that somatostatin neurons elaborate profusely in layer one. And we know that GABA released from somatostatin neurons gates presynaptic GABA B receptors, which we also know are on POM axons. And so it may be that there's an enhancement of that POM response in S1 but it's not from the POM neurons themselves. It's through this heterosynaptic interaction with somatostatin activity, where the activity may be going down and GABA release may be going down, which may then facilitate um, the uh, you know, depolarization in those axons. You mentioned engram cells, so I thought I'd ask a question about engram cells. Would you expect to see CFOS anyway when you have distributed trials, 200 trials over 24 hours? Do you think you would? Do you think it's even a, you know, because usually people are just doing like foot shock, you know, fear yeah. conditioning, that sort of thing. So, so do you think it's a actually a different processing system? I suppose when you have such distributed learning over time. Um. So a, a great question, and so let me tell you a few things that, are, that will surprise you. Um, so many years ago, this won't surprise you, but because you probably know it, but many years ago we had developed a transgenic mouse that expresses GFP under the control of the FOSS promoter. And so the idea with those animals, and they've been used by many, many labs, and, and there have been many subsequent iterations of that general idea, um, 
to identify neurons that have been activated by some in vivo experience. And that has been super useful. And many of you can think of many studies that have been done in the hippocampus or the amygdala. But in primary sensory cortex, evidence for engram cells or um, experience-driven neurons that may somehow be related to um, that training is really weak. And I'll just give you one example of an experiment that we've done that really makes us question what those neurons could be. So there are plenty of phos expressing cells in somatosensory cortex. And we spent a lot of time looking at the properties of those cells. Um, they are there when we train the animals. They don't increase, and we monitored them longitudinally, and we really didn't see any particular addition or loss of those cells. If we take the animal awake or anesthetized under the scope, and we stimulate its whiskers for 30 minutes or more, we see no increase in phos expressing cells in S1. We don't see an increase in the number of cells. We don't see an increase in the intensity of cells. Sensory stimulation itself is really not a great way to drive phos in, uh, in primary sensory cortex. And if you want to talk about, for example, in visual cortex, um, uh, some of the experiments that have been done, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, but in these experiments, in whisker cortex, when we stimulate the whiskers, that's not driving FOSS expression. And if you, if, you, if you cut the whiskers, does the number of FOSS expressing neurons go down? Oh, that's a really interesting question. These data aren't published. But we thought if we cut all the whiskers off, that we would see no more FOSS. Um, we were trying to drive changes in FOSS expressing neurons. The biggest thing, the biggest stimulus we could draw, use to change the ensemble was to cut off all the whiskers or pluck them. And then all of a sudden, those FOSS expressing neurons, a totally new group popped up. They didn't go away. It was a new group of cells. I missed that bit. What, what happened when you cut off the whiskers? What did you say? The FOSS neurons didn't go away. Yeah. We just saw different ones. Ah, I see. Yeah. Interesting. Just to follow up, have you looked at any other immediate OD gene or, you know, maybe it's not FOSS, and there's like a whole debate in the engram field that my, it's, is it FOSS, is it ARC, is, or what are these, uh, you know, yeah. immediate OD genes doing? And, um, we had the ARC GFP mice for a while. We were no longer um, sustaining that colony. I mean, I will point out that in the hippocampus, ARC is associated with synaptic depression. And so, um, you know, I, I, it's not, actually, you know, when we were, you know, I mean, hotly in pursuit of, you know, FOSS neurons and the capture of, you know, synaptic potentiation in S1, um, I had a conversation with Sonia Hofer, who I was with on sabbatical in 2020. And she said, yeah, you know, we tried to do those experiments in V1, right? They have a very nice visual learning assay. And she's like, we never could find anything. I mean, some poor postdoc spent several years looking at it and never found anything. I, I think, you know, it's possible you can be in retrosplenial cortex and you'll see something, but not in S1. You see something. And it's actually worse than that, because part of the reason we were recording from FOSS cells, I mean, we wanted to image them. Part of the reason we were looking at POM is because we know that POM strongly drives FOSS cells. And so here was this beautiful assay where we saw POM input potentiation, and POM responds really nicely to multi-whisker stimulation, and we're pairing POM activation, multi-whisker stimulation with reward, and we know we're getting synaptic potentiation. And then we looked at FOSS positive cells and FOSS negative cells, and guess which one gets stronger after um, training. The negative cells, not the positive cells. And that's published. That's in a PNAS paper, I think it published a couple years ago. Right? Very surprising. Thank you. So I think this is a good time to transition to the um, discussion. So uh, let's thank the speakers again.